Hello, and welcome to Crew Call, the Below the Line podcast by, for, and about the crew. I don't mind telling you, I am extremely excited about today's guest, who has served as the cinematographer on two of my favorite shows, Veronica Mars and Glee. Please welcome cinematographer Joaquin Cedillo. Well, let's just jump right into this and get started. I mean, you can go back to your day. Um, first of all, thanks so much for, for taking the time to do the interview. Appreciate it. Of course. I'm flattered. <laughs> well, here we go. So, first question. When did you get started in the business? Um, well, I got incredibly lucky. I, I was accepted into USC's film school as a freshman um, way back a long time ago. And... Um, I have found, and I, and I advise a lot of students with regard to this, is the the actual education you get at school is uh, obviously is primary, but what is really, really, really important is networking, mm-hmm. because those students that you're working with and learning with in film school are the people who are going to be you know in the business with you, and they're going to be your peers and your bosses in in many or a producer. It's nice to hear that you go to school Absolutely. and you know, that you take the necessary steps. I I like that. I appreciate that. So how did you actually break into, to working? Um, you went to school, you networked, and then from there, did you meet people that just got you in or did you know someone that was already working? How did that, how did that work out? Again, I got, I got very lucky. My senior year, I was a TA for Jay Roach, who is a director, is a big director. He, um, meet the parents, uh, Austin Powers, those types of films. And he took me onto a, a very low budget film right out of school, literally took me by the hand and walked me into the production office and said, he's a hardworking, nice kid who will work his butt off for you guys. Can we find a place for him? And I got my first job as a grip on a, on a, on a very small film. Yeah. So I worked my first two movies as a grip. And then I worked for about six months as a second AC, which is the camera assistant. And then from there, I moved up fairly quickly because I was not big on carrying a bunch of equipment around. Again, I was willing to work hard, but it was sort of not in the wheelhouse of my uh, my strengths, I guess, both physical and emotional. But I was a, uh, a focus puller. I was the first AC for eight years. Um, and then I was a camera operator for eight years before getting the chance on Veronica Mars to bump up and start being a DP. Awesome. So here's a question for you. Which do you like to be called? Do you like to be called a cinematographer or do you like DP? Which title is more what you would prefer? Either one works for me, really. In my mind, emotionally, I guess, the more artistry that is involved and the more craftsmanship that is involved, the more the title of cinematographer suits me emotionally. But they're both they're both suitable, and I certainly wouldn't, on any budget film uh, of any sort of artistic caliber, I would not be insulted being referred to as a, as a DP or a director of photography. I, I'm totally good with that. Either of them work for me. Okay. Um, when you first became a cinematographer, I like that word too, <laughs> personally. Um, it does sound more <laughs> it's a artsy. Fancier, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what were the challenges that you faced when you first became a cinematographer, or did you face any challenges? You know, I think it was just um, confidence. Um, you know, uh, going from being an operator to a DP or a cinematographer, um, it, 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 it there's a lot more responsibility. Clearly, you're, you're you're sort of the captain of the ship in many ways, particularly with television. On movies, it's a it's much much more of a director heavy medium. Uh, whereas in TV, being the, being the cinematographer on a television show, you are the constant from the very beginning to the very end, and directors kind of rotate in and out. Okay, so also responsibility. You're responsible for everything, in a sense, for that department. Yeah, yeah a, a lot a lot of on my shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. So now, when you are a DP cinematographer, do you learn about the lighting as well as the camera? Does that go hand in hand, or is that something that's extra that you need to? Well, uh, again, I got I got really lucky in that I I think my my best attribute coming up was patience. Mm-hmm. Again, I was an assistant for eight years, and I was an operator for eight years, knowing that I wanted to be a VP that whole time. So okay. for 16, 17 years, I had 
I call it a luxury. I had the luxury of being able to set up the camera. Mm-hmm. I had a very specific and finite amount of responsibilities. As a camera assistant, you order equipment, you, you put down focus marks, you, 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 know, you build the camera, and you make sure that the shot is in focus, you make sure that the filters are right. You know, you, you carry out other people's orders, so there is a finite amount of responsibility, similar with an operator. You're given specific parameters of the shot, and you execute the shot in a, you know, a smooth and artistic way. And having just those responsibilities, if you want to move up, you have the luxury of sitting at the camera from the camera's perspective and being able to sit and watch all the rest of the process. You watch what lights are being set. You watch what diffusion is being set, how the lights are being colored, how the, how the light is being shaped. So you get to sit. It's like a classroom, in my opinion. It's like a, having your own private classroom as a camera assistant or, not, or an operator and sitting and watching everything start to finish being put together and built. Okay. My partner and I give our son and a lot of his friends and a lot of the kids that I mentor um, this piece of advice. God gave you two eyes, he gave you two ears, and he gave you one mouth, which means you should listen and you should watch twice as much as you talk. Mm, good one. And that's what I did. I sat and I watched and I learned and I soaked it in. And if I need, if I wasn't sure about what a light was, I would walk over and I'd look at how it was labeled or if, you know, we use a lot of very old lights and sometimes the labels are missing. But I, I, I ask questions. Is that a 5K? Is that a 10K? Is it a Fresnel? Is it a par? What what kind of light is that? And I would sit and watch and I would learn. And I made every set that I was on my own little private classroom. Um, so I didn't feel the need to come up through as, as the gaffer. I think often it's more difficult to come through the electric department. Um because as an operator or an assistant, you're already interacting with the director. You're interacting with the actors very, very, very regularly. And you get, you start to develop a re- the type of relationships that are going to be important as the director of photography. As, as the gaffer, sometimes you are a, a bit removed mm-hmm. from that process. The gaffer, I mean, although we're all, mm-hmm. again, we're a big family on Glee and everybody talks to everybody and there's no sort of hierarchy and Nobody, I don't believe that anybody feels any apprehension about speaking with the actors, but as an assistant or as a camera operator, that's actually part of your job is to um, communicate with the actors with regard to the, their, their marks and the pace at which they walk and things like that. Okay. So there's already an established relationship that will help you a great deal as a, when you become a DP. Oh, okay. So for people that are not sure about what a, a DP does, cinematographer, can you walk us through a day from beginning to end of what your job is like on set? So we arrive often early. Um, we're all given what are called sides. And those are, rather than everybody carrying on around a full-sized entire script, um, what, what the AD department does is they take just specifically the scenes that we're shooting that day and they make a photo, photocopy of those, and they um, reduce them to, I'm going to say, a five-by-seven sheet of paper-ish. And so that way we're all carrying around a very small set of sides, which are just the things we're doing that day, and they're easy to stick in your pocket. So you look at, you look at, look at the day, you, you look at how many pages we're going to be doing, and the complexities. Is it all in one set? Are we going to be changing sets? Are we going to go, be going on location? Are we coming back? Are we going to be making company moves? And emotionally, I sort of prepare myself for the day and say, okay, well, this is going to be a really heavy day. we got to look at an unusually fast clip. Or, you know, let's take time to do this. Just a, li- a little more artistry to it because we're only doing three pages and we've got two people the entire day. And we've got, you know, anywhere from 10 to 12 hours, depending on how they budget it today. Um, so then we'll go to our first set and we will do a rehearsal Um Kind of, it's called a blocking rehearsal where we, where the director decides how the actors are going to move, where they're going to sit, where they're going to stand, and how those changes in spots are going to be choreographed. Often, the director will look to me and say, "Is does this work for you? Is this an efficient way in your mind? Because dramatically, this works for me. It works for the actors. On a technical and logistical level, does it work for you? And I, I can make any suggestions and suggestions on how we can change." the blocking or the pacing to make it more shootable and economic. If it works, then I'm like, yep, thumbs up, let's do it. And so we bring the crew in and we do it one more time. It's called rehearsal for marks, meaning we'll actually put tape down on the ground and say, okay, this is, what, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. 
then they'll look to me and say, okay, what direction do you want to start with? And I make a suggestion based on, you know, what's easier. Sometimes it's, okay, well, which actor is going to be ready and gone through quite a couple of works, meaning hair, makeup, and water. It's going to be through the works first. Sometimes it's based on that. Sometimes it's based on where the sun is, if we're on location. It's, you know, any number of factors. So we decide how we're going to approach the scene. I speak with the director. They give me their parameters on what shot they would like and how they would like to handle it. Is it a moving camera? Is it static? Is it from further back on a long lens? Are we up close and wide for more of a comic effect? Um, is it steady cam? Is it on dollies? Is it handheld? And we go through all those questions very quickly and make our decision that we like. And if for some reason we are finished lighting and the cameras are set before the actors are ready, often what we'll do is we'll go to the next set. We'll invite the director and the ADs will invite, you know, either second team, which is what we refer to the stand-in as, second team, first team is the actors. And we go to another set and we will look at how we might approach that scene. So that if we're waiting for any more than literally 10 minutes for the actors on the first scene, we can start pre-lighting another set. And we just kind of go through the day and work until the actors are satisfied and more, as importantly, the director is satisfied with what we've shot. And then we move on. We just kind of work our way through the day. So you are you are interacting with the cast. You're interacting with the director. You're making suggestions. You're like a, your suggestions are a part of this, correct? So correct. to make it work, to make it look better. Um, so the director is also relying on you for feedback and for your um, expertise. Absolutely. I, I, I've always liked e- either of these two types of directors, either a director who comes in and is very decisive and says, this is, this is how I want to block this. I think this is the most efficient. Do you agree? Yes, I do. Um, and this is, this is, these are the shots that I want. And they specifically say, you know, then I'm like, okay, great. Thumbs up. You've told me exactly what you want and we will execute that. The other type of director I like is, this is how I'd like to block it. Does that work for you? Yes. These are, these three shots are the shots that I want. Otherwise, be creative, be artistic. You know the show, meaning me and the crew. The crew and I know how the show is supposed to look. And at that point, I'll say, well, how about if we do a moving master here or two long lenses from here? Or let's do a shot from outside the doors and that way the people are small because in this scene, you know, uh, Leah's character is feeling uh, alone and isolated. So let's do this big wide thing from outside the loft or outside the classroom. And she's very small through this doorway and making sort of an artsy fartsy shot. And, then, you know, usually they go, great, that's a lot, that's great. We love it. And then we move on. So one way is where the director says, this is specifically I want what I want and that is all I want. And the other is I want a couple of these things. Otherwise, have fun. Make it pretty. Make it fun. I throw out some suggestions and we run with the ball that I've thrown. Um, what doesn't make it easy is when, uh, and this hasn't happened in a long time to me, I think the last time we was on a different series, where a director comes in and they have not done their homework. And they try to push the show in a direction that is not in line with what the show is all about. For instance, Monica Mars, we tended to use very wide lenses with a very color, sort of a colorful noir thriller. Um, or like a detective show. And it had a very specific sort of range of lenses. I mean, we would, Kristen Bell is a gorgeous woman, and you know we could shoot a close-up on her with the 16-millimeter lens right up in her face, and she would still look amazing. And when directors would come in and they thought, oh, it, it's a, a procedural crime drama, and my idea is to shoot it like CSI, which is not what that show was about, Brock Morris was like at all. Right. So when someone approaches like that and you kind of go, well, how about if we do it like this? And if they get the sense that, oh, okay, Joaquin's trying to save me by pointing me in the right direction, then it goes well. But when they sort of puff up and say, no, I'm gonna, I'm the director around here. And I'm going to do it this way and blah, 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 blah. And the reality is that Rob Thomas on that show handed me the, the, the visuals and said, you are the keeper of this show. Your job is to keep everybody in line and make sure that when people are flipping channels and they get to my show, they know that they're watching Veronica Mars and they're going to stop and watch it. Um, so mm-hmm. when that sort of confrontation comes in where a director is really pushing to do something that falls completely outside the realm of the visual style of the show, that's the only time that it kind of gets ugly or bumpy. It'd be like if somebody came in to direct CSI and said, okay, I want it to look like Friends. 
<laughs> it doesn't right. make any sense, which to me says either you're completely right. crazy or you have never watched DSI and, you know, you, maybe you're not the right person for the job. Right. So would you say that that would be the most difficult part of your job is dealing with personalities and and um, attitudes with with the directors? It probably has been over the years. I haven't had to deal with that in a long time. Again, we have executive producers directing most of our Glee episodes and that they're, they're completely in line. They know what they want. And quite honestly, if Brad Falch, who's one of the creators of the show, says, I want to do something completely different. I am certainly not going to tell him that he's going to do that. <laughs> we're going to do what Mr. We're going to do what Mr. Falch wants. Mm-hmm. We've also gone way outside the box. Um, Brad Baker directed an episode uh, uh, called Shooting Star, where the, the the perception was that there was a shooting at McKinley High, and it, the script says that all of the lights get turned out and the kids go into hiding in the choir room. So we kind of had to finesse the look of the show to a degree because you know usually you know particularly at McKinley High it's sort of a bright, saturated, high color, poppy look at McKinley High, and we had to go yeah. in a completely different direction, which was really fun and exciting. And during our creative or tone meetings, we are given approval by uh, either Ryan Murphy or Brad Palcher to kind of go outside the realm. And they actually, they like going outside the realm. When, when I was given the show, I was told that there was, they loved the look mm-hmm. of the show. They loved what had been done in years past, but it was certainly not outside the possibility of allowing me to flex my creative muscles. Uh, similarly, as long as when people were flipping channels and they saw the show, the general public knows that it's glee. As long as I keep it within the box, I could yeah. kind of bang the sides of the box, maybe even put a couple of holes in the side of the box, but stay within the box. Now, is there anything, um, technically speaking, that you would say is particularly more difficult to perform than other tasks? There are a couple of things that are difficult for me. Sometimes the logistics of getting through the day because we do an exorbitant amount of work every day. You know, we do anywhere from three, and I think our high was 10 songs in one episode. It's a lot of work. I mean, it's, yeah, we've done, I think over, now, over 700 songs on the show. Wow. In five, in five seasons. So it's just, uh, it's literally, it's just the amount of work um, and sort of keeping a good attitude about it because I, I'm very passionate about what I do. I love what I do. And I particularly love doing what I do on Glee I mean, and dancing all day, you know? Although I can't sing, but I still kind of dance on the side mm. um, <laughs> But sort of keeping a positive attitude because again, as, as, as as we discussed, I, a lot of responsibility falls on my shoulders with regard to making it through the day, making the show look pretty, making the show look like it should, and doing it all with a smile on my face. I'm not required to do it with a smile on my face, but it certainly makes it easier on the troops that I lead when the guy who's leading the charge is feeling positive and good about things. So I try to, you know, try, trying to make it through that many musical numbers and that many hours. I mean, last year, I think, last fiscal year, I worked 3,100 hours, which averages 60 mm-hmm. hours a week on a 50-week year. And we don't work 50 weeks, which means they spread out mm-hmm. fewer weeks. So we do right. a ton of hours. And it's just physically and emotionally exhausting. So I think that's the greatest challenge, is continuing to... I know emotionally I appreciate my crew. I love my crew and I love cats, but sometimes when mom or dad, being me, is tired and cranky and they snap at the kids, it's not because they don't like their kids, it's because they're tired. And so I'm trying to make it through that many hours and that many weeks and being a good leader throughout, that's the hardest part for me. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to do a great job on the show. I want the show to look great, but I also want everybody who is involved in it and works so hard on it to go home feeling proud of the work that we're doing and to feel good about the day and not kind of go, well, you know, I, he was just mad at me all day or he was cranky or he, he kind of bummed me out, you know? Mm. And I, again, the crew works so hard that, and they're really professional and really great at what they do. Now they should go home feeling good about the work. Now, I know that it's, it's a, 
it's a lot of work, like you said, with all the music numbers, but does that make it more oh, yeah. fun in a sense? Because you're doing like different, you have to be a little bit more creative and you get to, you know, you get to change around with the scenes and everything. Does that actually, even though it's a lot of work, does that make it a little bit more fun than just a basic show? Oh, absolutely. 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 Um, but again, when I was, I was taking the show, it was, it was, you know, there's plenty of room for artistic expression. So, and exactly what you said too, that the fact that there's so many musical numbers and as if you if you've seen many episodes of the show, the numbers are either real, meaning you know, like during a competition or you know, rehearsal or something, or they're a complete fantasy, uh, or they're just an emotional state of mind where you know somebody will turn and suddenly they're either in a different location or in a different outfit, made up differently. They do their song and then at the end of the song they turn again and they're back in reality and nobody has nobody in reality has witnessed that performance while been inside Leo's head or in there in a you know uh head or I guess like her um it, it it does it, it absolutely breaks it up. Uh, as much as I again as much as I love what I do, I don't know that I could do a show that would set in an office for you know mm-hmm. months and months at a time. I I, I you know maybe in twenty years when you know when I'm ready to retire or there's less in me or I'm emotionally, you know, artistically wrung out. <laughs> Exhausted. <laughs> exactly. Then I could sit and do, you know, um, a, a, a talk show. show. Which, yeah, there you go, a talk show. <laughs> and, which all, all of those shows are valid. And I'm sure all those guys that shoot talk shows or, you know, three cams that come, they love what they do. It's just sort of not in my, the wheelhouse of what is uh, fulfilling to me. So I, I will often choose jobs that I find creatively uh, challenging and creatively mm-hmm. satisfying. So here, here's a question um, that I think is really important. Um, with all these hours that you work and what it does to you as far as uh, emotionally and physically being drained and whatnot, how does that affect your home life? How do you juggle that and how do you make it right and, and make everybody happy? It was it was more difficult when my son was at home. Um, I, I've got uh, my partner and I just have one child or a child, no longer a child. He's twenty six. Mm-hmm. Um, so when he was a teenager, it was a little bit more difficult. Um, luckily, on that very first film that um, Jay Roach took me in on and said, "Hey, you know, the nice kid, so he'll work hard for you." That's where I met my. I was just under twenty five years ago. And mm-hmm. my partner was a producer on that. And so luckily from the beginning, we worked in the same industry and we both got it. We understood, we understood that it was sort of, a, Craig had been in the business a little bit longer than I have, Craig was three years older than me. So he had a, you know, three or more year jump on me. And, okay. um, so, but he, he got it. He understood the hours. He understood the dedication. He understood what was necessary to the business. Um, he was also incredibly generous when we adopted our son. He took close to six years off of production and stayed home with Josh and, you know, got him to school and, and he wrote when Josh was in school, new fantastic scripts and worked very hard, uh, but worked from home. So I was incredibly fortunate to have him who would do that. And vice versa, if, if Craig had a commitment on a show, and he needed to be there, I would have done the same thing. I don't know that I would have done it with the same smile that Craig did it because Craig is, <laughs> we're, we both love being fathers. Craig is unusually dedicated and just a, an incredible partner, an incredible father. Um, so with the Greg family, I got lucky with that. Josh also t- tended to spend as much time as he could on set with me. So he okay. would, during Veronica Mars, he would uh, come down San Diego. They were both from San Diego. And uh, during the summer months, when Craig, when Josh was out of school, he would work as uh, an extra. He worked his background because it worked for him. He was 16 to 17 years old and he would show about high school teenagers. So we've both been very fortunate. And, and again, I think the fact that we were both in the business, some people would find that difficult because you need somebody who's a little bit more grounded and whatnot. But for us, our dynamic works beautifully. And it, even after 25 years, I think being away from each other so much 
for many weeks for <laughs> <Helps>. hours, <laughs> or hours. Yeah. Oh, it totally helps. Um, there was an interview. There was an interview with Dolly the other day because she's coming up on her, I think, her fiftieth wedding anniversary, and she said that they're going to get remarried. And somebody's asking, you know, how do you make that work because you're on the road so much? She said, that's exactly why it works because we stay the hell out of each other's face. Right. But for Craig and I, I think uh, I have found that if you spend every waking hour with your significant other, sometimes you have nothing to share with them at the end of the day. This is true. I think honeymoon period. At the beginning, Craig and I spent all our time together. All of our time together. We spent almost no time apart. And having time apart, you, you're able to experience things outside of being right next to someone. And then you can come home and say, oh, this is what happened at work today. Oh, this is what happened. And then you can eat. Craig tells me about his day. I tell him about my day. But it also, again, after 25 years, if, let's say, my second day of work, back to work on Glee, I come home and I've been gone for 13 hours. Craig will come running to the door. Throw his, arm, throw his arms around me and look so grateful that I came out. I'm, we're very fortunate. And I know all relationships in the entertainment business don't work out that way. We happen to be incredibly blessed, incredibly lucky. Oh, well, that is so nice to hear. Uh, no, I agree with that. You, it, it gives you more appreciation for the other person because you do get to spend that time apart. And then when you're with them, you're like, oh, you know, you, you realize why it is that you like to be with them so much. Absolutely. It's great to hear that you love what you do and that you love the current job that you are on. Um, and it, saying that and knowing that you've had such a great career and, you, and, and you've and you been lucky because you, I think because you really love what you do and you really were focused and you were determined to, to do what you're doing. What would you suggest to someone just starting out in the business? Well, so, well, just sort of on the logistical level, um, and sort of a technical level, uh, in order to work on a television show in the camera department, you have to be in the union. So that mm-hmm. should at least be in the back of your head somewhere. Like, and I, I could, I might get this wrong because I've been for a long time and occasionally the rules change, but I believe mm-hmm. that you need 100 paid days as a camera assistant. It, it can't be, an, it can't be an internship. It can't be student films. I don't think it can be student films. Um, mm-hmm. And it can't be working for free. And, um, so you have to figure out a way to get on a non-union film or some film where you keep track of those, you keep your pay stubs, you get a letter from your producer saying, Joe Blow was hired on this date through this date and he did a total of 12 days at $100 a day, signed so-and-so. Do you have to have those 100 days within a time frame? Yes, I believe it's within three years, just those 100, a total of 100 days. Again, okay. sometimes the rules change, and I'm not positive. I had actually heard you know, when okay. I paused before that maybe student films did count, which I found unusual, but, you know, good luck to everybody. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> so that just <laughs> on a technical level. Um, okay. Uh, and I think once you either can get your foot in the door, whether it's uh, a, lot, a lot of people, when I was an, when I was an assistant, I, I found a lot of um, new people would, go through the rental houses like Panavision and back then it was other Nemec, but there's also uh, Aeroflex and Claremont. There, there are mm-hmm. a lot of rental houses and they would print up business cards that said camera intern or camera assistant or whatever they wanted to be doing. And they'd go in and they'd introduce themselves to all the, all the camera assistants prepping so that if oh. for some reason somebody fell through, somebody, you know, wasn't able to do the job, whatever, you know, occasionally camera assistants will, will let you sit and watch just, you're not really allowed to do the union thing. You're not really allowed to touch anything. So you can sit and they can explain things to you and you can learn at least in the, in the camera houses. I don't know how welcome that is because you, I mean, they certainly don't want, you know, dozens of people showing up unannounced and uninvited right. into these places. But you can also, you know, Los Angeles, you see those those yellow signs all over the place that have um, yeah. directions to where people, where, where shows are shooting. If I if it were today, and mm-hmm. I was new and I was out looking for work, I would stop by every set that I saw on the street and say, "Hey, mm-hmm. my name's so and so. I want to become a camera assistant. If and when they're not busy, could I approach your camera people and hand them my business card?" And then you go up, and if they or you watch, and you you know you see where the camera is, and you wait until 
you know, you have your, your chance where there's not too many people around. You walk in and you introduce yourself to the operator or the, the uh, or one of the camera systems. Or you get a job with production. You start out as a PA. If you know anybody in the, you know, on any show in, in the business, you say, I want to be a PA. And, and you kind of resign yourself. You're okay, I'm going to work as a PA on this first job for what I, I'm, I have no idea. I, I think they pay minimum wage. It's not a lot of money. It might be above minimum wage. I'm not sure. But if you do it with a fantastic attitude and you kick ass at whatever you were asked to do, yes, sir, no problem. I got it. I'll take care of that. Not a problem. Yes, sir. I got it. Not a problem. Every single day, people are going to notice that. And without fail, someone's going to walk up to you and go, you are a fantastic PA, but what do you really want to do? And those people who ask are the people who have noticed that you have a wonderful attitude and you're doing something they would never want to do in a million years. And they're going to go, you know what? I'm going to help you get where you want to go. And that's how you move up, by having a really great attitude. Most people who are, at, who are asked to go and run and get coffee, that's not what you want to do for a living. I was a, I was a camera operator in the union by the time I was 27. I was a VP by the time I was 35. And I started directing by the time I was 45. And I guarantee you that in some significant way, maybe not a big way, but in a significant way, the fact that I make a really freaking great coffee had something to do with it. <laughs> and, and I never rolled my eyes and I never complained. I said, not a problem. White sugar, brown sugar, cream, milk, half and half. How do you like it? And that person went, you know what? You need a great camera assistant. He's really good at the technical stuff, and he's got a fantastic attitude. And I like being around this guy because I'm going to be around him 12 hours a day, Monday through Friday, for weeks and months at a time. And I can teach someone to be a great camera assistant. I cannot teach someone not to be an a-hole. <laughs> right. So be a great person. Be someone people want to be around, and they will teach you what you need to know. Because again, they can't teach people not to be jerks. Thank you so much. Those are wise words from a wise man. I hope everybody everybody understands and listens to this advice because it is a theme <laughs> and it is the truth. And basically you need to, if you love what you're doing, it's going to show and it's going to get recognized and it's going to, you're, you're going to succeed. There you go. Thank you so much, Joaquin, for spending some time with us. We really appreciate it. Our listeners appreciate it. Oh, the pleasure was mine. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm very flattered to be invited. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. And love to hear from you again. Absolutely. You invite me back. I'll be here. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Joaquin. You bet. Take care. crew call. If you'd like to support the podcast, remember to click the Amazon link on the top of website before you go shopping. It doesn't cost you anything and Amazon gives us a little kickback. Everyone wins. And if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. Good or bad, we really appreciate the feedback. Thanks again to Joaquin for telling us about life as a cinematographer. Tune in next week for assistant production coordinator Jasmine Barcelo.